Welcome to GESM 160, Mind, Belief, and Behavior, Learning About Learning. This week, you will be introduced to educational psychology and measurement. Have you ever wondered how people learn or what makes people want to learn? Are the same processes involved when a person is learning new terminology as when they are learning how to drive a car or learning how to make their way around a new place, like a college campus? What increases a person's ability to learn or what hinders it? How can we take charge of our learning and our motivation or how can we help others be more motivated? Educational psychologists seek to answer these types of questions as it is the application of psychology and psychological methods to the study of development, learning, motivation, instruction, assessment, and related issues that influence the interaction of teaching and learning. The research and theories in educational psychology assist instructors in creating effective learning environments for students, but help students manage their own learning as well. In this day and age, when learners have access to so much information at the click of a button, and when more and more classrooms are being flipped, it is vital for learners to know how to self-regulate their own learning and motivation. What is academic self-regulation? It's the strategy students use to control the factors influencing their learning. Self-regulated learners use appropriate strategies to manage motivation, behavior, and learning. This implies that there's a toolbox full of different strategies and that the students not only make a choice, but make an appropriate choice as to which strategies to use when they are studying for different tasks or preparing for different assessments. They control the factors influencing their learning and establish optimum conditions for learning. This not only implies the manipulation of environmental factors, but also cognitive and emotional factors that impact learning and motivation. Obstacles are removed that interfere with their learning, and basically students will find a way to learn. This implies a focus on the end result of mastery of whatever learning is taking place and that different strategies and restructuring will be used to remove these obstacles. Finding a way to learn not only implies that learning is important, but implies that the student has self-motivation and the student is able to continually re-motivate themselves to achieve the end goal of learning. Let's conduct a short self-assessment. Are these statements typical of you always, sometimes, or never? Take note of which questions may present more of a challenge for you and which may be strengths. The six questions in the previous slide asked about your ability to use the six components of self-regulation, which are motivation or why we engage in the learning we do, methods of learning or how we are learning, what strategies we're using, use of time, when do we choose to engage in learning? Physical environment, where are we learning? Social environment, with whom are we learning? And monitoring performance, or what are the outcomes of our learning? Each of these areas is crucial in becoming a self-regulated student. The relationship between the components is multiplicative, meaning if one of these is zero, the learner is not self-regulated at all. Learners need to be efficient in all six components in order to successfully regulate their learning. For example, a student can be very motivated to study for an exam, coordinating a study group way in advance, using the best of learning strategies, including past quizzes and assignments to determine their strengths and challenges in the course. But if the student is not regulating their physical environment and they are attempting to hold the study group in their dorm, this can cause the study group to be a complete failure. Their roommate can bring friends over to hang out. The smell of dinner down the hall can distract some students and cause them to angle for an early ending to the group. The sound of loud music or a party can be enticing to the group. Or the bed can lure an overtired group member to take a nap instead of participating. Again, the most successful learners use all of the components of self-regulation. Let's look at them each individually. Motivation, or why we learn. There's a lot of common wisdom in society about motivation, but what do educational psychologists say about it? Motivation, 
are the goals, beliefs, perceptions, and expectations that give behavior its energy and direction. Without goals, one does not have motivation or may have what's called pseudo-motivation. Think about yourself when you were writing your last paper. When you were faced with distractions, did you motivate yourself to complete the task anyway? Did you have a goal in the first place, like finishing the first section of the paper or finding appropriate resources in order to write it? Can one be motivated without a goal? Unfortunately, no. Without a goal, it's likely that a student will give up when first faced with distraction or difficulty. Think about some specific goals that you have. These can be academic, extracurricular, or personal goals. When we have goals or an end result in mind, we tend to push through obstacles and find a way to achieve our outcome. In fact, the most successful people know how to motivate themselves when they do not feel like performing a task. This is an important note, as we'll find throughout the semester that motivation is really more of an affect or emotional issue. Some examples of self-motivating techniques are goal setting, positive self-talk, arranging rewards or punishments for success or failure at a task. For example, giving yourself some screen time after completing the first section of your paper. We'll go more thoroughly into each of these techniques throughout the semester. Methods of learning, also known as learning strategies, are the methods students use to acquire information. Learning strategies are like a toolbox. Think of a construction worker. If someone is building a house, a hammer and nails are extremely important, but a variety of tools are needed to complete the structure. The same is true in academics. A student cannot study in the same manner for essay exams as they would for multiple choice or true-false exams. Different tasks require different study strategies in order to maximize learning. The simple fact of academic survival and excellence is that higher achieving students use more and better learning strategies, such as turning headings into questions and only underlining the answer. But many students believe that they're not successful due to ability, when in reality, they have never been properly taught how to learn. Use of time also greatly impacts self-regulation. Time management is a skill that can be developed. And ultimately, students with better time management skills tend to have higher GPAs than students with poorer time management skills. This is contradictory to common beliefs that tests such as the SAT are great predictors of final GPAs in college. In fact, even in graduate school, time management skills, along with self-testing skills, were better predictors of first semester medical school grades than the MCAT scores. Students that have issues with time management usually only plan short or not long-term goals. They are focused on the urgent tasks at hand, such as finishing a paper that's due the same day or the next day, and not the necessary or important tasks, such as planning for a paper that's due the following week. Although we can't actually manage time, we can manage ourselves, and many students believe that there's not enough time to complete the tasks ahead of them when in reality, students do not know how to manage the amount of time available each day. In discussing use of time, we'll also look at procrastination, which common wisdom says is a lack of time management skills. Throughout the semester, as we take a look at both time management skills and procrastination elimination strategies, we'll see that procrastination is actually a motivation issue. The regulation of the physical and social environment is the ability of learners to restructure their physical and social environments to meet their needs. High achievers reported greater use of not only environmental restructuring, but also help seeking. What is environmental restructuring? This is the ability to locate places to study that are quiet and not distracting. It is important to know how to restructure physical and social environments to meet needs. You will likely find out, if you haven't already, that studying in your dorm room is one of the absolute worst places to study. Ranking somewhere between the 405 freeway and rush hour traffic and a Tiesto concert. When thinking about structuring your social environment, think of the following questions. When should you study alone or with others? How do you seek others to study with? 
Who do you study with? How does one seek assistance or guidance from a professor? And what questions are okay to ask in class or in office hours? We know that students who need help the most seek it the least. This fact may be affected by the student's faulty beliefs about their learning. For example, if a student has a fixed mindset and their focus is on proving that they're smart or proving that they've got it, they're going to be less likely to seek help because this would be evidence that they may not have everything that they think they have or that they're trying to prove that they have in terms of intelligence. And so a student who needs help would be less likely to seek it. Monitoring one's own performance allows a learner not only to control and critique their performance, but also to become their own coach or mentor. This allows them to make the necessary changes to meet the goals. In order for this to happen, students need to look at their exams or assignments in depth and go thoroughly through the feedback that they've received. Unfortunately, this is not the reality. What do students usually do with their exams? They look at the grade that they received and then they put it away. Most of the focus on the assignment is done up front when preparing for the assignment and very little is done afterwards. This could be a crucial mistake when becoming a self-regulated learner. Self-directed learners go thoroughly through the feedback they've received and find new areas for their effort to focus. This ensures continual improvement and continual focus of their efforts. In essence, self-regulated learners learn to evaluate their performance before it evaluates them. So why does self-regulation matter to your learning and motivation? As undergraduate students, you've surely found that in college there are many more distractions. The work is harder and there is more of it, and it's faster paced. There's more competition between students in the classroom, in the lab, on the field, and in the studio. Professors expect their students to be self-motivated and to come to class prepared not only with materials, but with proper learning strategies. There are no study guides in college. Instructors expect you to guide your own learning. Basically in college, students are on their own, and this highlights a key point in the difference between high school and college. There is a great shift from teacher-directed learning in high school to student-directed learning in college. Students become the CEOs of their own college career, and it is expected that they are motivated and self-directed to not only set goals, but to achieve them. All of these factors can impact not only your motivation to learn, but your actual learning and academic performance. In order for educational psychologists to understand more about a person's mental processes, strengths, challenges, attitudes, beliefs, and personality traits, psychometric tests are utilized. But what is a test? When we hear the word test, we usually think of answering questions on a paper. Maybe you picture a Scantron or a multiple choice test or even a lengthy standardized test like the SAT. But in reality, a test can also be a tool, a device, an investigation, or even some type of performance. So when we're testing people, what are we assessing? We assess achievement or the level of knowledge in a particular domain. For example, you will take a quiz for Unit 1 after watching this video to assess your knowledge of the readings. We assess personality, or a person's unique and stable set of characteristics, traits, or attitudes, such as an assessment of motivation. Aptitude, or a person's potential to succeed, can be assessed, as well as a person's ability, skill, or competence. These last two tests can sometimes overlap. Lastly, we assess vocation, as in the COPS inventory we will take in this course later in the semester to measure our job-related interests. And now that we know what we're testing, why are we testing? Oftentimes, tests are used to select individuals, the way the SAT is used to help universities select students to enroll, or placement to ensure a learner is put in a course that will be conducive to their learning process. Psychometric tests are also used to diagnose problems such as the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, or MMPI, being used to diagnose personality or mood disorders. 
hypothesis testing is used in experiments to answer research questions. And lastly, we use tests to classify. For example, the COPS inventory may help a person understand which careers are best suited for their particular strengths. Here are some helpful pieces of information to consider when thinking about tests and measurement. First, some behaviors can be observed more closely and precisely than others. It may be relatively easy to measure if a learner has the right answer on a test, but much more difficult to measure their motivation to study for the test. Second, our understanding of behavior is only as good as the tools we use to measure it. It takes a lot of effort, expertise, time, and money to create testing instruments that are accurate and reliable. Test and measurement tools can take on many different forms, such as the traditional paper and pencil, or self-report, observation, or even a performance format. Part of giving an effective test is choosing the best format for the research question being asked. Next, the results from any test should always be interpreted within the context in which they were collected. For example, think about taking an assessment from an advanced educational psychology course after only listening to this lecture. The background knowledge and experiences of the test takers must be considered when interpreting results. In addition, test results can be misused. This often creates controversies such as the current debate over how to fairly and effectively test K-12 students who are still learning English. Finally, many tests, especially achievement tests, have a goal of distinguishing between those who know the material and those who do not. When tests are used effectively in a classroom setting, instructors analyze the results of the test to see where their students' strengths and challenges are. This way, Concepts that may be more challenging can be reviewed or retaught. Finally, as you are learning this week, reflect on these questions. Can you motivate yourself to do less preferred assignments or tasks without waiting until the last minute? Do you have different learning strategies for different tasks? Are you able to ask for help when needed? And what types of tests will you complete this week? What are they measuring?